This lecture will be on the topic of hemorrhagic shock, which is a form of hypovolemic shock. In this slide, I want to show you the effects of blood loss on blood pressure. In the top graph here, we're showing the effects of a 20% loss of blood that is occurring over about a 10 minute period of time. So we start to have the blood loss here. We see there is a fairly rapid decline in arterial pressure down to about 75 or so millimeters of mercury in this example. And then the blood loss is stopped. So we stop the bleeding. If you follow now the mean or aortic pressure over time, you'll see that it gradually recovers. And after about six hours, it's recovered to you know, more than 90 millimeters of mercury. And this phase of recovery following the loss of blood we call compensation. Now let's compare that with a much larger loss of blood, in this case a 40% loss of blood volume. Once again we see a very rapid decline in pressure and the way I've drawn this, I'm showing that the blood loss is occurring over about a half an hour time. And so now the mean aortic pressure is only about 50 millimeters of mercury, which is quite low with a 40% blood drop. Now over time, once you stop the bleeding, the blood pressure will gradually recover in some individuals. That would be compensation, as we saw with the smaller blood loss. However, note that after six hours, we're still a long ways from a tree achieving a normal blood pressure. So the compensation is not near complete at this stage. It will take much, much longer without intervention of, let's say, fluids and drugs that you can utilize to help to increase the blood pressure more rapidly. But in some individuals with a 40% loss of blood, we might see this partial compensation and then suddenly it peels off and blood pressure again starts to fall even though there is no bleeding occurring. And this is called decompensation. Things have occurred within the body itself that are preventing the normal compensatory mechanisms from occurring. And when decompensation occurs, it is very difficult to intervene and to successfully resuscitate. Now, a variety of factors influence the response to hemorrhage. One that should be very obviously obvious to you would be the amount of blood loss, whether it's 10%, 20%, 40%, or, or even more. The greater the, the blood loss, the lower the pressure will be following the hemorrhage period, and the longer it will take to recover if there is recovery at all. Also, the time course of the hemorrhage will be very important. If it's a very, very rapid hemorrhage, you will expect to see a greater fall and a more rapid fall in blood pressure compared to a slow hemorrhage, which gives the body time to activate compensatory mechanisms to help offset the loss of blood. Other factors that can influence the response to hemorrhage would be, for example, coexisting conditions. Let's say it's a person who is in very poor health, it's a, is an elderly person, and, they're, and they, they're frail. And they do not have much reserve in terms of autonomic responses that might be depressed because of comorbidities that they might have. So the responses will not be as, as robust to help offset the loss of blood. And another factor that can play a role are various medications that a patient might be taking. They might be cardiovascular drugs that might be blocking some of the compensatory responses that the body needs to initiate to recover blood pressure. Or let's say the person is under anesthesia that would affect especially the autonomic function and autonomic responses to a loss of blood.
Well, let's talk about this idea of compensation and look now at mechanisms that contribute to it. Uh, compensation we can define as neurohumoral negative feedback mechanisms that work together to maintain or restore arterial pressure and provide adequate perfusion of vital organs following blood loss. There are a number of compensatory mechanisms, some of which you have already been, um, been familiarized with in previous lectures. So let's go through this list, and I will be going through nearly all of these in much more detail now on subsequent slides. The first one that's listed here are baroreceptor reflexes. These are the most important primary and initial reflex to help restore blood pressure, or at least to maintain blood pressure in the face of a loss of blood volume. We also have circulating vasoconstrictors. These can be part of the RAS system. It can be things such as vasopressin, catecholamines. All these can contribute to the compensation. Chemoreceptor reflexes, so blood gas changes, can play an important compensatory role. Reabsorption of tissue fluids. Renal reabsorption of sodium water, which will help to increase the blood volume after a loss of volume. Activation of thirst mechanisms, so the, the person will drink more, take in more fluid to help restore blood volume. Cerebral ischemia in very severe ischemia is kind of a last ditch effort by the, by the body to uh, restore blood pressure to a level that is sufficient to provide adequate perfusion of the cerebral and coronary circulations. And finally, a topic that we're not going to be covering in this lecture, it's a long-term compensatory mechanism, and that is hematopoiesis. Well, let's look at the baroreceptor and chemoreceptor reflex uh, pathways involved with blood loss. So shown here, we have blood loss that decreases arterial pressure, that then initiates a baroreceptor reflex. And the baroreceptor reflex then, which is initiated very rapidly, will cause cardiac stimulation and systemic vasoconstriction and cause a redistribution of blood flow and volume within the body. So for example, some organs may find a decreased blood flow because of sympathetic vasoconstriction, and that helps to shut blood flow to more important organs such as the brain and the coronary circulation. So that's what I mean by redistribution of flow and volume within the body. Well, the chemoreceptor reflexes are responding to altered blood gases, and they will then initiate the chemoreceptor reflex that will also produce cardiac stimulation, reflex vasoconstriction, and flow and volume redistribution. The chemoreceptor reflex is not rapid like the baroreceptor reflexes because it takes a while for the blood gases to change. Chemoreceptor activation, it's responding to blood gases and pH changes that are associated with hemorrhage. Now the arterial oxygen content and the saturation may remain normal unless pulmonary ventilation perfusion ratio is altered significantly. So a person might normally have a, an arterial oxygen saturation of 94%. Even with a, even with a 20 or 30% blood loss, it may remain at that 94 or maybe drop to 93%, but it's still going to be in, within a normal range quite frequently. But there are other changes that take place. And one is metabolic acidosis, and that results from impaired organ oxygen delivery, and therefore that leads to a turning off of aerobic metabolism and turning on of anaerobic metabolism that leads to the production of lactic acid. 
and that can stimulate central and peripheral chemoreceptors to, sympathetic, to increase sympathetic activity. And another mechanism by which we can have chemoreceptor activation is through decreased flow to the carotid bodies, which can cause something that we call stagnant hypoxia. The carotid bodies, which are the peripheral arterial chemoreceptors in the body, they have a very, very high flow rate per, per gram weight of tissue. And so they have a very high oxygen um, delivery with to the actual cells within the carotid bodies. When blood pressure is reduced, the flow of blood through the carotid bodies is reduced. That reduces the oxygen delivery to cells. And even if the arterial oxygen content is normal, the fact that you have decreased flow within the carotid bodies, that means that there's a decreased oxygen delivery, and that leads to hypoxia within the carotid bodies, or what we call stagnant hypoxia because of reduced flow, which will then lead to a chemoreceptor reflex that can lead to tachnipnea, in other words, increased respiratory rate, and sympathetic activation of the heart and vasculature. A key concept to keep in mind at this point is that autonomic reflexes are rapidly activated in response to hemorrhage as the initial compensatory response. So anything that would interfere with those reflexes will dramatically affect this initial response to, a, to blood loss. Another important compensatory mechanism involves circulating substances, humoral compensation. So blood loss leads to an activation of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone, or the RAS system. And that activation will lead to the production of vasoconstrictors, such as angiotensin II. And that will cause increased um, constriction of the resistance vessels and help to increase systemic vascular resistance and help to increase blood pressure. RAS activation acting on the kidneys, you know, angiotensin II and subsequent aldosterone formation will lead the kidneys to retain sodium and therefore retain fluids. And that can lead to an increase in fluid volume. And RAS activation can also have a relatively minor uh, cardiac stimulatory effect through uh, angiotensin 1 receptors on the heart, but it's relatively minor. So most of it is vascular and volume. Well, blood loss also stimulates catecholamine release from the adrenal medulla. And the catecholamine release, uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine, will act on alpha and beta receptors to increase blood pressure through vasoconstriction and cardiac stimulation, and will also increase uh, blood volume by acting upon beta-2 receptors in the kidney and increase stimulation, further stimulation of the RAS system. And finally, and also I should point out that, of course, the catecholamines will stimulate the heart too. And finally, blood loss leads to vasopressin release or antidiuretic hormone. And its main effect is to increase blood volume by stimulating the reabsorption of water by the kidneys. But vasopressin at high circulating levels that, that occur in response to hemorrhage will also affect the V1 receptors on blood vessels and cause vasoconstriction. So a key concept here regarding humoral factors is that humoral mechanisms reinforce autonomic reflexes on the heart and circulation, and they act on the kidneys to conserve fluid. Now, keep in mind that the kidney response is a delayed response. It takes a while for the kidneys to, to alter their, their 
transport of sodium and other ions and to reabsorb water and to gradually increase the blood volume through the retention of fluid. So it's a slow mechanism. The humoral response is slow relative to the very rapid autonomic responses. And then as a clinical note, something that I alluded to in an earlier slide is that patients medicated with cardiovascular drugs, drugs such as alpha blockers or beta blockers or drugs that alter the RAS system, so angiotensin II inhibitors or ACE inhibitors, Patients who are taking these drugs, and many, many tens of millions of American patients are taking these sorts of drugs, and these drugs may have, may, may lead to impaired uh, compensatory responses to hemorrhage. Another mechanism that's important, now this is a longer term mechanism, it involves the reabsorption of tissue fluids. In response to hemorrhage, because of the fall in arterial and venous pressures, capillary hydrostatic pressures uh, fall. And you also have, and you also have an increase in precapillary resistance. Uh, arterials are constricting, you know, proximal to the capillaries. This also lowers the capillary hydrostatic pressure. And these changes will cause increased capillary fluid reabsorption from the interstitial space back into the plasma compartment. And this transcapillary fluid reabsorption can account for up to one liter per hour that is auto-infused back into the circulatory system from the tissue interstitial spaces. But because you're bringing water and electrolytes primarily back into the plasma uh, by this mechanism, the capillary plasma oncotic pressure can fall from a normal value of about 25 down to about 15 millimeters of mercury due to this auto infusion. And because capillary oncotic pressure is, follow, is, is falling, that will limit the rate of capillary reabsorption because it is this high oncotic pressure to capillary that helps to promote reabsorption. So if you dilute those plasma proteins with fluid, it will, it will self-limit the amount of fluid that can be reabsorbed from the tissue spaces. Furthermore, with this tissue, um, this translocation of fluid from the interstitial into the plasma compartment leads to hemodilution, which causes the hematocrit to fall, and that will decrease blood viscosity. And that has hemodynamic consequences. That will actually help to increase the blood flow to a tissue. Even though you're reducing the hematocrit and the amount of oxygen that's being delivered by by the oxygen that is attached to hemoglobin, you have an increased flow. So the increased flow at a given pressure due to the decrease in viscosity helps to overcome the fact that you have reduced hematocrit. Another mechanism, and I mentioned previously that this is kind of a last ditch effort by the body, and that is cerebral ischemia. When the mean arterial pressure falls below 60 millimeters of mercury, then we see that brain blood flow decreases because the pressure is below what we call the autoregulatory range. The, the brain is able to maintain a pretty constant blood flow down to mean arterial pressures of around 60 millimeters of mercury because they respond to the lower pressure by dilating cerebral vessels to maintain the blood flow. Now that's a very important uh, vascular function in the brain. But once that pressure gets down below 60 millimeters of mercury, the vessels are maximally dilated. They cannot di dilate further. So as the pressure might continue to fall below 60, then you start having large uh, decrements in cerebral perfusion. When cerebral ischemia, or this inadequate supply of blood and oxygen to the tissue, when this occurs, it produces a very intense sympathetic discharge. 
that is several fold greater than the maximal sympathetic activation caused by the baroreceptor reflex. Now let's look at decompensation. On an earlier slide, I showed that if a person is, has a 40% loss of blood volume, they might begin to show some compensation, but maybe over an hour or two, suddenly we find that arterial pressure might fall. That's decompensation. It is the failure of neurohumoral compensatory mechanisms to maintain a critical level of arterial pressure that's sufficient to perfuse vital organs, despite resuscitation efforts, which then leads to irreversible shock and death. And this can happen even if you were to add in a resuscitation fluid, let's say infuse into the patient whole blood, or saline and start to restore the pressure. If the pressure is not restored far enough, if, if it's inadequate, the resuscitation, then you can still go into this decompensation because the tissue has been exposed to this ischemic condition for such a long time that organs become damaged and dysfunctional. Well, let's examine some of these decompensatory mechanisms. One involves cardiogenic shock. And cardiogenic shock occurs when the heart is unable to sufficiently contract and increase or regulate its output. And in severe shock, we have impaired coronary perfusion because of the low arterial pressure. That results in myocardial hypoxia and acidosis. And the heart muscle responds by not being able to contract as well under these acidotic and hypoxic conditions. And that leads to systolic and diastolic dysfunction within the heart chambers themselves and can lead to arrhythmias. And that can be a mechanism that contributes to decompensation. Another mechanism is sympathetic escape. And I'm using this term in, in the context of vascular sympathetic escape. A loss of vascular tone or a decrease in SVR, which is normally elevated by the compensatory mechanisms, you can now have a sudden fall in the SVR, a loss of tone, and that would then cause progressive hypotension and organ hypoperfusion. This most commonly occurs in skeletal muscle and in the GI circulations following prolonged severe hemorrhage. And furthermore, increased capillary pressure causes increased fluid filtration and hypovolemia because in the, with the loss of precapillary sympathetic tone, capillary hydrostatic pressure increases. And so maybe, even though you may have been reabsorbing more fluids initially, if you now lose the precapillary uh, arteriolar tone, capillary pressure will start to rise now again, and that will lead to increased fluid filtration. So let's look at decompensation in terms of how positive feedback mechanisms can dominate negative feedback mechanisms. In this diagram, I'm showing arterial pressure and how it relates to baroreceptor firing and medullary sympathetic activity to the heart and blood vessels. So hypotension normally elicits a negative feedback response. And that is an attempt to restore arterial pressure. So a fall in arterial pressure leads to baroreceptor, a decrease in baroreceptor firing which leads to increased medullary sympathetic outflow to the heart and vessels and stimulates them. So the heart will be stimulated by increasing rate and contractility or inotropy. Vessels will be stimulated by autonomic activation to constrict. And these changes now 
will help to restore arterial pressure. So that's the normal negative feedback loop that occurs in response to hypotension. However, with prolonged severe hypotension, that causes cardiac ischemia and loss of function despite the negative feedback mechanism. So what happens is that the heart can no longer respond adequately to this enhanced sympathetic activity. And if the heart cannot, and, and, and the vessels too, if they cannot respond adequately because of high, being hypoxic and acidotic, then blood pressure will continue to fall. And you get this fall in blood pressure that feeds back positively and that further reduces the perfusion of the heart, which further reduces its function, which further reduces arterial pressure, which comes back and further reduces cardiac function. So that's a positive feedback cycle that will now start to, to decrease arterial pressure. So under these conditions, positive, a positive feedback mechanism that's triggered by cardiac and vascular hypoxia and ischemia can prevent the normal negative feedback mechanisms that would normally attempt to restore arterial blood pressure. This is just another way of looking at these negative feedback mechanisms. So if we have severe hemorrhage, you get a decreased cardiac output, leads to a decrease in arterial pressure, leads to decreased coronary perfusion, leads to decreased inotropy or contractility of the heart. That decreases cardiac output, further decreases arterial pressure, and you get this vicious cycle here. This is a positive feedback loop here. Also, decrease in arterial pressure, decreases organ blood flow. If you have decreased organ blood flow, that causes tissue hypoxia. Tissue hypoxia results in sympathetic escape. In other words, instead of the blood vessels constricting to this heightened sympathetic activity, they can no longer contract their smooth muscles, and so these vessels now will dilate that will further decrease arterial pressure, further decrease organ blood flow, cause more hypoxia of the tissues, cause more vasodilation, and a greater fall in arterial pressure. So this over here on the right is also a feedback cycle, but in this example, it's for the vasculature, and this is the positive feedback cycle for the heart function. There are several other compensatory mechanisms, and these are all kind of operating together. Cerebral ischemia and hypoxia. Cardiovascular medullary centers, if they become sufficiently ischemic and hypoxia, will, will begin to shut down because those neurons won't be able to fire without oxygen to supply ATP, which is necessary for their function. So that will lead to a loss of autonomic outflow which would lower blood pressure, which would further cause cerebral ischemia and further depress medullary function. Metabolic acidosis, that, when that occurs, that depresses cardiac and vascular contraction. We also have rheological factors that impairs oxygen delivery and exchange. Increased microvascular viscosity due to a low flow state occurs within tissues. Normally, when blood is flowing through a capillary bed in the microcirculation, you see that red blood cells are nice and spaced out between, the cap, but, but between each other as they're flowing through capillaries. But under very low flow states, these red cells start to clump together as rouleau formation. And when these cells clump together in these capillaries and these small microvessels, they increase the resistance to flow. In other words, they're increasing the viscosity of the blood, which increases the resistance to flow. And so that will further impair blood flow within the tissue. Also associated with severe hemorrhage is microvascular plugging by leukocytes and platelets.
because in severe, in severe hemorrhagic shock, you get an activation of the cascade system. And so you start to get microthrombi that occur as well as inflammatory responses that cause leukocytes to start rolling and sticking to the small postcapillary venules and they begin to plug up these microvessels, which further impairs oxygen delivery and exchange. Then over here on the right, we have a systemic inflammatory response that occurs during hemorrhage. Endotoxin can be released into the systemic circulation from the GI tract. As the blood flow is shutting down as a compensatory mechanism to hemorrhagic shock, the, the cells lining the GI tract can begin to die and slough off because they become hypoxic. And therefore, the barrier that prevents bacteria from going from the gut into the bloodstream in the wall of the gut, that barrier is broken down. And so you can then develop a septic-like condition or, or actually true sepsis. And that leads to cytokine formation, such as tumor necrosis factor and various interleukins. And there's enhanced nitric oxide formation. We get free radical induced cellular damage. So you have superoxide anion hydroxyl radicals that are producing this sort of cellular damage. You have increases in capillary permeability that occur in response to this, in, this uh, inflammation. And so you then you would further increase the loss of fluid into the tissue spaces from the blood. And this can lead to also multiple organ failure. So a key concept regarding decompensatory mechanisms is that prolonged shock leads to organ damage and initiates decompensatory mechanisms that cause cardiac depression and vasodilation. Once these mechanisms are activated, they are very difficult to reverse. And so once a person starts to go into a terminal shock condition, by the activation of these decompensatory mechanisms, you can pump in a lot of fluids and give a lot of vasopressor drugs to try to increase arterial pressure and you will not be able to maintain arterial pressure. You will not be able to restore it to a level that is sufficient for survival because the damage has already been done. 